I'm here outside of a Bahama breeze, and I really only have one question. Why? Not why am I standing here, but rather, why does Bahama breeze exist? It's good food, might cost more than it should, but it's a night out, right? Something inexplicably draws me to Bahama breeze and places like it, but I don't know why. I've had better and far more enjoyable dining experiences, sometimes even for less money, so why do I find Bahama breeze so interesting? The more I think about it, the more I realize it falls into this nebulous definition that I can't quite pin down. Restaurants like Applebee's, Olive Garden, Romano's Macaroni Grill, uh, things like that, they just fall into this nebulous category. Even Red Robin is at the periphery of this definition, so I know there must be a definition, but what is it? Then it occurred to me, I live in Chicago. With a few exceptions, I don't really see these places anywhere. To get to these places, I have to drive out to the suburbs. And that's when it clicked. These places aren't really popular anywhere except the suburbs. But this just makes sense to me. Bahama Breeze and Friends are a part of suburban culture. And this just seems like a fact in my mind. No one told me this. It's just something I noticed. And that's when I started to notice a lot of things about suburban culture that I hadn't really thought about before. Uh, the soccer mom archetype, uh, the massive amount of parking in front of uh, poorly patronized stores, uh, the two-car garage where uh, at least one of the cars is a sedan. These all seem like a canonical notion of suburban culture. Now you might hear the phrase suburban culture and think, whoa, whoa, whoa there, Whitey. Uh, you're just throwing the word culture around all willy-nilly. All right, let's just address that right now. This video does not intend to critique the existence or the culture of the suburbs. Are the suburbs an expected and welcome product of the late stage American dream? Or is it where the American dream goes to die? It's not really my place to say. I want to make it abundantly clear from the outset that while I did do research and for the most part am not talking out my ass, it's possible that I got some stuff wrong or extrapolated too hard. I don't have a sociology degree to back up anything I say. I'm just some dude talking to a camera in a room. So grain of salt with all of this. But I think it'll make some sense. Uh, feel free to mercilessly mock my misunderstanding of the text in the comments. This video also will not look at the artistic representation of the suburbs. Uh, believe me, there are some wacky ones like uh, Suburbicon, Greener Grass, anything Tim Allen has done. Uh, most of the representation of suburban culture and art has generally either been satire or used as a vague plot device vis-a-vis -vis a marketable setting. But again, I'm not really here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about suburban culture, if that even is a thing, and to find out what the point of these restaurants are. Why? Perhaps it is important to talk about what culture is before deciding if something is or isn't culture or is or isn't a result of culture. Uh, unsurprisingly, culture has an exceptionally broad definition. Uh, according to Wikipedia, don't worry, I'll use real books in a second. Culture is an umbrella term which encompasses the social behavior and norms found in human societies, as well as the knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, and habits of the individuals in these groups. This definition is hardly a definition at all. It's vague enough to call pretty much anything humans do in a group over some decent amount of time a culture. There are narrower definitions of culture that deal with something called cultural universals, such as art, music, cooking, dance, religion, rituals, clothing, etc. And while this does make sense, it seems like there are so many cultural universals that the concept itself seems moot and we're back at the original definition. And I think you'll agree that we can distinctly delineate a collection of social norms, laws, customs, and habits from the suburbs. We are cutting corners here. Art is listed in the definition, and culturally speaking, I don't think I would say suburbia has an identifiable art style. Art can come from the suburbs, but unless it's about the suburbs, it's not really identifiably suburban art. I mean, so too goes for other universals. If you know of a counterexample to that statement, I'd love to hear it. Someone brought up architecture as an art form earlier, and I'm still fighting with myself over if suburban architecture exists in art the same way as other architecture does. We're getting off topic. So I'm not so quick to dismiss suburbia's culturehood. I'm gonna say suburban culture does exist, but just know that it's only two thirds of a truth. And what we're really talking about are the social norms and customs that make up the society and the institutions therein. And we're kind of skirting around the arts and expression portion of it. So maybe it's not completely culture, but honestly, I don't know what else to call it. Maybe if we can define it? Oh, <laughs>
This is a tricky one to answer, uh, without sliding into stereotypes and parody, because when you think of what suburbia is, you do tend to think of things like Serial Moms and Yes Dear and anything Tim Allen has done, but perhaps there's a bigger trap that you can fall into trying to define this sort of thing. Uh, inexplicably, I found it very easy to mistake suburban city planning for culture. There are a lot of characteristics of the suburbs that feel like culture, but are really just aspects of city planning to cater to or produce the culture, whatever that may be. I'm talking strip malls, cul-de-sacs, clear separation between residential and commercial zones, low density but increasing population, single family homes on small plots of land. They all inform culture, but they aren't culture. I'll be honest, it's kind of hard to find objective sources about what suburban culture is. It seems like modern sources disparage the suburbs, calling them a drain on the soul, marking them as bad for society as a whole. The general thought, at least nowadays, is that the suburbs combine the disadvantages of urban and rural areas, and that they destroy the soul by being impersonal and depressing. And just as a side note, I've noticed this sort of thing in all sorts of content about the suburbs. Uh, the movies I mentioned earlier, the research I've done. <laughs> I mean, heck, just living in a city, I hear people talk negatively about the suburbs all the time. While I was researching for this video, I came across a book called The Promise of the Suburbs by Sarah Bilston. Uh, it wasn't super useful in the food part of this video, uh, but I found this quote from the summary quite interesting. Literature has, from the start of the 19th century, cast the suburbs as dull, vulgar, and unimaginative margins where, by definition, nothing important takes place. Sarah Bilston argues that such attitudes were forged to undermine the cultural authority of the emerging middle class and to reinforce patriarchy by trivializing women's work. But that sounds like a whole other can of worms that I have neither the time nor the PhDs to get into. So why am I not answering the question, what is suburban culture? And the answer is, because I can't. I mean, not really. Everything I think of either makes more sense from a city planning standpoint, or goes further into the psychology of why they exist, which we'll talk about next. But everything I can think of seems to fall on either side of culture, leaving this big culture gap in the middle. The fact that defining the culture is so hard could indicate that culture is already too strong of a word. I mean, we already conceded in the last part that we had to really, really qualify the definition of the word. But I can't think of a word that means feels like culture, but isn't. I promise we're getting back to the restaurants eventually, but we need to establish what the suburbs are for because it will build the context we need to answer the question, why is Olive Garden? When I first thought of making this video, I thought it was a cultural thing. Uh, that's why I left that entire part of the script in here. But attacking this from a culture angle isn't working. So... My main source for this is a book by Greg Dickinson called Suburban Dreams, Imagining and Building the Good Life. While critical in many aspects, it tries to objectively observe suburban life and why it might exist in the way that it does. And boy, am I about to quote the ever-living out of it. The book talks about nostalgia, modern spatial anxieties, and the need for safety. Dickinson argues throughout the book that the big reason people, especially those with children, are so drawn to the suburbs is that they are sold as the good life and that they embody, perform, and construct the good life within a world nearly overwhelmed with tenuous and contested understandings and enactments of the good life. At some point in grade school, we were taught about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, while the model is heavily contested in psychology, we'll be using it here since the underlying concept is generally agreed upon. At the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, we find things that are required to survive, like uh, food, water, air, sleep, etc. Uh, now, let's assume that those needs are met. The next level up is safety. This includes emotional and financial well-being. The suburbs serve these needs, if not in reality, then certainly in marketing. When you think of the term inner city, what do you think of? Uh, words like crime, decay, other not nice words might have come to mind. If you're from the suburbs, that's almost certainly what came to mind in one way or another. For well over 100 years, U.S. political and cultural discourse has framed the city as a site of decay and crime. As Steve Masick argues, from the 1970s to the present, much discussion of the contemporary city expresses and produces a moral panic that infected the general public, particularly the suburban middle class, convincing them that the city creates and houses deeply disturbing race and class conflicts. Suburbs offer what Dickinson will call the effective aesthetics of safety. 
This makes sense, right? Uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm drawing no difference between real safety and imagined safety since we're viewing suburban life through the lens of someone that subscribes to this notion. If it feels safer, then whether that's actually true or just something that you're sold, it doesn't really matter. And besides, I have to be reductive or we'll be here all day. The book also talks about modern spatial anxieties, a feeling of placelessness tied to nostalgia or being far from home as both a notion and a place on a map. A uh, feeling of ungroundedness, a uh, strong desire to belong, perhaps as you would in a more close-knit culture. Locating oneself in time and place responds to a fundamental requirement of personal and social identity. While there can be pleasure in being lost, with its frisson of unexpected encounters and new experiences, this pleasure comes in relation to a more fundamental sense of locatedness. Memory and locality serve as ways of negotiating the relationship between safety and risk. These fill needs at two levels of Maslow's hierarchy. Feeling rooted in both time and place serve as both safety needs and the needs for belongingness. But most suburbs are placeless, timeless, built on land that is practically unidentifiable from other suburban land. Modern spatial anxieties raise questions about our rootedness in both time and place. Because the city was often imagined as the constitutive site of anxieties, Post-World War II suburbs are offered as responses to the difficulties imagined and built into the city. But, built of whole cloth, suburbs could not only be other than cities, they also need to offer imaginative and material resources that could directly respond to anxieties about our unrootedness in place and time. Brand new suburbs designed outside of the strictures of either time or place are not well suited to the problems raised by modern spatial anxieties. Rhetorically constructed memories can bridge this gap between the desire for a new and cleansed not urban space and the need to drill our personal and communal identity into place and time. That was a big quote, but I took it for a reason. That last sentence about rhetorically constructed memories bridges us from why the suburbs exist right into the whole point of this video. Yeah, we're finally going to talk about... Why? And we're going to stick with the same book because about a quarter of it is about eating the good life. I'm really happy I found this book. It's full of information that's presented in a somewhat objective way. There's two reasons why the placelessness of the modern American suburb is important to understand here. First, it drums up a desire for place and groundedness, which can often be found at the family dinner table. Family dinners, Dickinson claims, are on the decline, but families still express a desire to eat together. Pair that with the fact that the number of meals eaten away from home are on the increase? You can guess what the market's answer for that was. Appealing directly to families and family life, post-war chain restaurants inserted themselves into suburban culture and have become distinctly suburban spaces. Suburban restaurants are important because they serve as a crucial material and effective node in suburban family life. They offer relational and caloric sustenance. Relational sustenance, at least as I understand it, is just another solution to nostalgia about family dining. Families around the dinner table taking time out of their busy modern schedules to talk to one another, not on their phones, smiling, laughing. Look at us, we're out as a solid family unit. Look at us, other families that are inevitably eating at this Olive Garden. We're better than you. Uh, sorry, I uh, got a little carried away there. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, but the second reason, and perhaps the more sociologically satisfying reason, is that uh, these chain restaurants allow people a way to interface with the broader world, but in a safe way. A way tailor-made for the suburban notion of safety we talked about earlier. Chain restaurants existed well before the Second World War, but their growth accelerated when the war ended. Diners became more popular in suburban America as they became more American themselves by smoothing out their ethnic specificities so as to appeal to Victorian family values. Shifting gender roles also played a part in this. Many women were a part of the workforce at this point. Diners moved to provide traditional family meals instead of women cooking at home. In fact, according to Dickinson, chain restaurants didn't re-ethnicize until the late 20th century. Uh, by this point, the notion of culinary multiculturalism began to emerge as a positive trait, and thus, chain restaurants began to answer that call. I mean, think about it. The first Olive Garden opened on December 13th, 1982 in Orlando, Florida. The first Romano's Macaroni Grill was opened on April 19th, 1988 in Texas. Bahama Breeze opened in 1996. The Cheesecake Factory opened in 1978, but that's essentially American cuisine that started as a diner in California. So given all of this information, 
doesn't it just make sense that these restaurants exist in the suburbs? Restaurants that exist everywhere that give placeless suburbs a way to interface with other cultures, even in the watered-down presentations of the restaurants in question, that also serve as a family dinner table away from the family dinner table. After all, when you're here, you're family. Think about the marketing of these restaurants, beyond just the tone deaf. The uh, song in the commercial was copyright claimed, so uh, a little bit of chicken fried, cold beer on a Friday. <laughs> the cowboy gets me every time. It's horrible. I can't believe this actually aired. Anyway, marketing. Many suburban restaurants seem to put an emphasis on things being handcrafted, homemade by chefs that were trained in Tuscany, which is mostly a marketing lie, by the way. The same care, love, and attention that you would get in home-cooked meals. These restaurants walk a fine, fine line between local and global, neighborhood community and worldwide industry, locally sourced foods and global food industry, and number 10 cans of tomato sauce. If you think about the demographics, the intrafamily demographics that these restaurants span, it's actually kind of impressive. And beyond just the marketing, think about how these places look externally. The oversized horses in front of every P.F. Chang's, the whimsical bow art coppola and florid script over the entrance of the Cheesecake Factory, and the candy-striped awnings of TGI Fridays, all announce from the outside the abundance found inside. Dickinson talks about this idea of abundance. This applies to more than just food, but this is an important point. In order to be an appealing dinner table away from home, they have to have more than just convenience. Rather, they have to show great value. Lots of food for little money. Olive Garden's endless soup, salad, and breadsticks. Uh, Red Robin's bottomless fries. Golden Corral's feeling that I can only describe with the grimace emoji. But beyond just the value of the food, there's abundance in other categories as well. The phrase, build your own, comes to mind. Have you ever had a restaurant tell you how many possible combinations of appetizer samplers or pizza makeups or whatever you could achieve? Okay, so I've done the math on this never-ending pasta bowl. There's 42 different sauce and pasta combinations. Yeah. I mean, you're in control, right? As if you were at home. The abundance of choice also contributes to the value of a suburban restaurant. And just as a side note, I don't think I've ever seen fast food restaurants or upscale dining establishments use these marketing tactics. More abstractly, there are restaurants that essentially offer a fixed price menu, offering a starter, main course, and a dessert for a reasonable sum of money. Vast combinations and a good deal truly play into this abundance out of value thing I'm talking about. Abundance and performance go hand in hand. I'm going off the rails a bit here and extrapolating from the contents of the book and combining it with my own experience and theories. Uh, here's my sociology degree to back me up. Oh wait, there are three performances taking place at once. Uh, performance to oneself, performance to your family, and performance to your community. I think this is best articulated with the concept of wine. <laughs> that was stupid. In the US, wine isn't as common. It's more common in like Spain, Italy, France, but here in the US, not so much. It's almost like a status symbol of sorts. And so here lies the performance. First with yourself. You feel fancy. You feel good. You don't do this at home, do you? You're an adult. You worked hard this week. You earned this. And then with your family. Husband and wife drinking together like they did when they were younger. Nostalgia. It's romantic. And it's still romantic because we love each other. No children. You can't have a taste. It's alcohol. And we earn this by being older. And finally, the performance to the community that I alluded to earlier. The Abundance! A king at his feast surrounded by pastoral images of Italy or whatever. My never-ending breadsticks. My wine overfloweth. Look at us and see that our kingdom is of high class and status. The upperest of middle. That's eh, just a bit of hyperbole on my part, but I think you understand the images I think they're going for here. You want to feel good about yourself. You want to feel good as a family. You want to feel better than your suburban peers. I mean, not in the exaggerated way the movies about suburbia show you, but art does imitate reality. Suburban dreams and constructions are frequently made compelling through powerful appeals to memory. Suburban films often situate narratives in nostalgic longings for small town past <coughs> Homer Christmas movies. <coughs> Lifestyle centers reimagine early 20th century urban downtowns. Chain restaurants like Olive Garden or Macaroni Grill embody, admittedly thin, 
memories of Italianicity, and domestic architecture continually places homes in some vaguely executed European or American past. And so the mnemonics of contemporary suburbs are varied and diverse, taking as their explicit and implicit content a wide range of memory possibilities. Nostalgia, abundance, value, and performance. That's what this all boils down to. Nostalgia for a place or an idea of home you may or may not have ever had. Uh, nostalgia for how much better it was when you were growing up without phones at the dinner table, when life was simpler. The abundance of choice, the abundance of style, the freedom to choose what you eat as you would at home, all the love and care you'd put into feeding your family with none of the time commitment or effort while still being perceived as an amazing value, and the roles you perform at the dinner table to yourself, uh, to your family, and to others, all in a safe way to place yourself in the world while simultaneously interfacing with it. That's why these restaurants exist. <laughs> So we finally answered my question. Why is Bahama Breeze? But we still haven't answered why I'm so fascinated with these restaurants' existence. What made me want to make a video on this in the first place? The honest truth is, I don't know. Growing up, I didn't really go to these restaurants very often, so perhaps it's as an outsider looking in with morbid curiosity. Despite growing up in a suburban environment, I feel like we were always at the periphery of suburban lifestyle, never fully participating in it. When we did, it was very interesting to see what it was like, but I wouldn't quite say I was missing it. The world is a scary place. You know it, I know it, the seagulls crapping on my deck know it. In a world like this, we find ourselves struggling with our identity. Who are we? What does it mean to be American? Where do I live? Why do I live here? I'll give you an example. I live in Chicago. More specifically, I live in Uptown. There are people who live in Hyde Park, River North, Ukrainian village. These are dense city neighborhoods, but they all seem to have their own identity. If you go west on the train for a little bit, you run into some nice places. But do you think people say, I live in Downers Grove with pride? I don't know that they do. The world is changing. Fast. The future used to be the future, but suddenly the future is now. When did that happen? We are both the benefactors and the victims of a rapidly modernizing world. I can't believe I wrote that sentence as so hashtag deep. It's easy to get wrapped in the warm blanket of nostalgia for a simpler time. Am I right, fellow 90s kids? The market's answer for all of these perceived problems is the suburban restaurant, positioning itself as the solution, providing a stage of abundance to perform your familial selves. I mean, after all, isn't that what it's all about? In the boring world of late modernity, boring because the world is so overwhelmingly scary, so abstracted, so inscrutable, suburban restaurants and their articulation of family offer the possibility of powerful, emotional lives. The size of the serving stands in for, represents, and elicits the size of the emotional life proffered. I'm not here to take these restaurants down. I just wanted to understand why they exist to serve one demographic, why they're so successful and where they came from. It's really interesting, and I suggest you read the rest of Greg Dickinson's book if you're interested at all about this sort of thing. It talks about suburban developments, lifestyle centers, churches, and more. Uh, it was a very interesting find. If you ever find yourself hating the suburbs, just remember, there is a reason they exist. Perhaps a flawed reason, I'll let you be the judge of that, but it's a reason believed by many just hoping to find the good life.